Welcome to Reimagine, everyone. It's the final days of our fall festival, Creating Space. I have had the great personal pleasure of developing this new conversation series with filmmaker Kirsten Johnson. And it's the last of the three sessions that we've piloted together. And does anyone really like endings? When you're hearing a good story, like Kirsten usually tells, uh, we usually don't want it to end. I don't want it to end at least. Uh, my name is Andy Engel, and I'm a member of Reimagine's programming team. First, I want to thank our sponsors. Next slide, please. Uh, they've been by our side this whole year. Thanks to all of them. We could not do this work without you. And I also want to give an additional shout out to Family Caregiver Alliance, Museum of the Moving Image, and Rooftop Films, our co-hosts for this series, who helped us get the word out. And of course, since we're nearing the end of our fall season, on a personal note, I want to thank the entire Reimagined staff for being such a supportive team. Brad Wolf and Derek Cosberg, Margaret Byam. Special thanks tonight to Zubin Desai and Carrie Lang for helping me run this Zoom call. And of course, immense gratitude to our board members, particularly Jeannie Blaustein, who was the person who led me to Reimagine Land. We have Otter Notes in Zoom, which can provide a live transcription if you like. Click at the top of the screen. This gathering is being recorded and we will share this with all of you who have registered. Now, please type in the chat where you're calling in from. I'm in New York City, which is also known as Lenape Hoking, and it's the indigenous land from Western Connecticut to Eastern Pennsylvania. So that means you, Kirsten, are also in Lenape Hoking, being in Connecticut. And it also stretches from the Hudson Valley to Delaware with Manhattan as its center. Also, keep, keep it going with the chat, please. Also for the chat, we have a prompt tonight, courtesy of Kirsten and her special guest, Deepak Chopra. And the question is, what is the self? According to a conversation that Kirsten and Deepak had last week, that is the question. What is the self? In other words, what makes you, you? So please type that into the chat now and tell us what you think. And now a bit about Reimagine for those who don't know. Reimagine offers experiences like this one, programs that spark conversations about end of life and break taboos that surround death and dying. Since the pandemic, we've been providing space online to support those grieving and feeling isolated. In addition, we're providing a forum to mourn our losses collectively. And I hope to see many of you tomorrow night for our closing candlelight vigil featuring writer Neil Gaiman, Rabbi Sidney Mintz, and our own executive director, Brad Wolf, who will say a few words at the end of today's program. We've referred to Kirsten's series as, quote, an unconventional conversation series, end of quote. So what makes this unconventional? Un Rather than having a physician, a clergy person, or a grief expert lead these conversations, I've asked an artist to do it. Often when we have questions about the end of life, we seek out medical specialists. And I'm referring to both traditional doctors and integrative healers. We consult with funeral directors, with end of life doulas, with social workers, chaplains, and clergy. And so many of these professionals provide excellent and essential guidance. That's why they're a part of Reimagine Conversations. But often new ways of thinking about difficult topics emerge when those professionals are in dialogue with someone whose career is dedicated to art and creativity. Perhaps what's also unconventional for an event hosted by an organization focused on end of life is that our esteemed guest, Dr. Deepak Chopra, doesn't believe in the concept of death. Last week, Deepak told me and Kirsten that death is an illusion, just like the special effects in Kirsten's film, Dick Johnson is Dead. But in fact, to question the reality of death, I think sits comfortably with one of Reimagine's central values, which is to wonder and to marvel at the end of life and life and to wrestle with them. Deepak Chopra is a person who digs deep into questions. He's an exemplar of self-inquiry 
and a world-renowned pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. His nonprofit entity, the Chopra Foundation, is dedicated to research on well-being and humanitarianism. Please check out the foundation's initiative, Never Alone, which is doing amazing work on mental health and suicide prevention. And the web address is neveralone.love. He is also the founder of Chopra Global, a whole health company at the intersection of science and spirituality. He is a prolific author of over 90 books, including the one that I recently read that Deepak has next to him, Life After Death. Um, and his latest book is Total Meditation. And for more information, you can go to deepakchopra.com. Deepak, just like members of this audience, you chose to be with Kirsten tonight and you chose to be with us. We're so grateful. Uh, for those of you who may not have seen Kirsten's film on Netflix, here's a brief summary. In Dick Johnson is Dead, Kirsten tries to keep her 86-year-old father alive forever. Utilizing movie-making magic and dark humor, she celebrates Dr. Johnson's last years by staging fantasies of death and the afterlife. Together, dad and daughter confront the great inevitability awaiting us all. The film was awarded a Sundance Special Jury Award for Innovation in Nonfiction Filmmaking and two Critics' Choice Awards. Kirsten and Deepak will chat for about 45 minutes and then we'll leave 15 at the end for Q&A. At that time, you can put questions in the chat and we'll help field those to Kirsten and Deepak. Kirsten, thank you for trusting and reimagine as a container for the questions that your film raises. You are a delight. Uh, before the two of you begin to schmooze, I'm going to describe the final scene of your film, Kirsten. Dick Johnson is dead. Kirsten is in a closet and she's recording a voice memo on her phone and she dictates the following. What can you say when you've lost a best friend or a mother or your best friend and your father? All I know is that Dick Johnson is dead. All I know is that Dick Johnson is dead all I can say is Dick Johnson is dead. And all I want to say is long live Dick Johnson. What I love about this monologue, Kirsten, is that the viewer can interpret this in so many ways. It's about the mystery of the human life cycle. Kirsten, I'd love to hear a bit about these words and that final scene that I was describing. And then Deepak, I'm curious if you see any relationship between these verses and mantras that are used in meditation. So Kirsten, please take it away. Oh, Andy, what an amazing introduction that was. It's so full of love and generosity. And I sent it right back to you for um, creating this set of containers, these little squares for us all to be in together. And Deepak, I just have to tell you, I'm so honored by your presence and your generosity in having this conversation. And, you know, making this film with my father who is here on a stick with us now as an image, um, but here with his presence um, that is in the film and like sort of in me, right? Um, we set out, my father and I to say, is there a way that cinema could help us? Um, that, that the act of collaborating together could sort of teach us how to be together in this moment of his life. And when I, first started to um, think about the idea of the film, I had not yet consciously accepted the fact that my father had dementia. Um, my mother had lived with Alzheimer's for seven years. And honestly, I was, I was not going to do it again. <laughs> I was like, we've done dementia in this family once, we're not doing it again. Um, and so when it started to dawn on me that he really did have dementia, I questioned whether I could make the film whether um, it would be ethical to make the film. Um, but I realized in some ways, the principle of the film for me was in the same place. I wanted to find a way, like I wanted to ask cinema to help us be in this time together. And, um, you know, one of the things in, in spending time, Deepak, with your thinking and, and reading, I, I think about the like, um, the thing that you do on a daily level, uh, the practice you have of like, thinking of the sort of healthy emotions 
and choosing to think about healthy emotions like joy and generosity and happiness and creativity. And so I was like, all right, like making a film with my father in this moment that is so challenging for me, maybe it can teach me how to live through this period. So the whole point of the film in some ways was like, can this film teach us how to make it? Um, which is how I got to the closet, Andy, <laughs> because I was living in a very small apartment with my father and my twin children. And um, every we were in the middle of making the film and I wasn't gonna use voiceover in the film. And then some people who had seen the cut of the film said, wow, you're throwing your father under the bus, but you're not throwing yourself under the bus. You have to reveal more about yourself. And so I started messing around with voiceover and I took my phone into the closet because it was the only place I could be quiet. And I started recording, but then my dad kept waking up and coming into the closet and opening the door on me. And little by little, in listening back to those recordings of me trying to sort of say something important for the movie and then my dad interrupting me, I had this like realization around time and that this time with my dad was precious. This like process of trying to make something with him was precious. And then it was like going away. Uh, but so it was in the repetition uh, that I, you know, that we sort of got to this way of experimenting and making this movie. And I just love Andy that you came up with the connection to the mantra um, because, you know, in some ways this film is play and it's practicing, um, but I've never thought of it as a mantra. And I, I guess, um, you know, like it just came to me, the mantra that I would say to my father would be, please don't go. But the truth is, you know, my mother died in 2007 and she is right here. So Deepak, I'm handing it over to you to respond to Andy's prompt, lovely prompt. So Andy asked um, mantra. Mantra is a statement of truth, which is often contradiction and paradox. For example, if I make the statement, I'm a liar, then if I'm lying, I'm telling the truth. And if I'm telling the truth, I'm lying. So which one is it? Um, and when it pertains to death, then the question is, what is life? Okay, who dies? What dies? And, uh, you know, you'll come across many definitions of death, including one that says that life is a sexually transmitted incurable condition that always ends in death. Um, <laughs> so it begins as a fertilized ovum, then a zygote, then an embryo, then an infant, a baby, a toddler, a teenager, a young adult, an older adult, an older person, then somebody possibly with Alzheimer's, dementia, and infirmity, and death. That's the sequence we see. But as you see that sequence, you still ask yourself, which is what Andy proposed as we began. He said, what is the self? Who dies? What dies? And if you really examine that, as I do, I've done this since the age of six years, you know, um, pondered on the mystery of death, which is so linked to the mystery of life. And what I've come to conclude is that death is not the opposite of life. Death is the opposite of birth. And life is the continuum of birth and death. So when I look back at my childhood and I say, look at that Deepak who was uh, sitting on his mother's lap and listening to fairy tales. Look at the Deepak who went to high school. Look at the Deepak who went to medical school. Look at the Deepak from yesterday. And you know what? They don't exist anymore. They're already dead. So if I asked you what happened to your childhood, it's gone, it's dead. If I asked you what happened to your teenage years, it's gone, it's dead. But what happened five minutes ago? What happens to these words by the time you hear them? They don't exist. Wittgenstein, the great German philosopher said, our life is a dream, we are asleep, but once in a while we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. So what we call everyday reality right now, this moment is a lucid dream in a vivid now. 
And by the time you hear these words or see my image, I won't have existed, the one you experience. So who dies, what dies? And when we look at the religious experience in every tradition, it doesn't matter what the tradition is, there are three things. One is transcendence, which means you find an identity which is beyond space, time and causality. That's the first thing. Second thing is the emergence of platonic values like truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And the third is loss of the fear of death because the essential self is not in time. It is not in time and therefore it is not subject to birth and death. So what dies? Die, what dies is a perceptual activity which runs a particular program um, which, of course, you can interpret in many ways. But death is a human construct based on the idea that you're a body. But which body are you? The body I'm using right now to speak to you didn't exist one year ago. 98% of all the atoms in my body have disappeared from last year. This is my 2020 model. And next year, you'll see a new model. And we'll have a conversation with a different Deepak Chopra. I gotta say, I can't wait for the 2021 body. <laughs> Bring on the 2021 body. Yeah. Deepak, you know, what you're saying about sort of um, your childhood self is dead, your teenage self is dead. And yet your six-year-old self is the self that sort of awoke to death. Mm -hmm. You have a really remarkable story of the encounter with death when you were six years old. Will you share that story with us? And I will share you why I link comedy and death in my story. That's beautiful. And by the way, I enjoyed the film very much, and especially the comedy, because unless we can take death with humor, we'll be suffering all our life. <laughs> Amen best, to that. The best way to deal with death is to laugh. Okay. Laughter is the best and most reasonable response to the mystery of death. But yeah, six years I'm in Bombay, what is now called Mumbai with my grandparents. And we get a telegram from my father who was in England at that time, that he had just uh, become a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. In post-colonial India, that was a big deal. So my grandfather took us, me and my little brother who later went on to become the Dean of Education at Harvard Medical School. My younger brother was four years old. Um, we went to the carnival, went to the movies, had a great dinner. Then in the middle of the night, my father, my grandfather died. He was so excited, I think he died from excitement. And so they took him to cremation. Next day, they brought his ashes in a little jar. And one of my uncles said, where is he? What happened to him? Yesterday, he was taking kids to movies and carnivals. And today, he's a bunch of ashes in a jar. So that was my first existential crisis, the mystery of death. Where did my grandfather go? Mm. And my brother, his skin started to peel off. He became so vulnerable. Every doctor couldn't diagnose him till somebody said he's feeling vulnerable. So he's shedding his skin. When his parents come back, he'll be fine. And so it happened. So at the age of six years, I had a clue on the mind-body connection and also a yearning to understand the mystery of death. Mm, mm, mm. Um, you know, this moment of your brother shedding his skin, I mean, I, I find it always so um, remarkable how uh, metaphors sort of express what we are going through. Um, and we had a wonderful mo moment with my mother when she had Alzheimer's where she was sort of looking out the window and she said, you know, I keep wondering what's on the other side. and and it was like, it was sort of not really her style to say that. And I, and, and I was like, really, mom, is that what you're thinking about? And she said, yeah, I just, I, it's so hard for me to imagine. I can't imagine what is there, what is on the other side. And, and I was really like, wow, she's going there. She's thinking about, you know, life after death. And then she picked up the placemat that was on the table in front of her and she turned it over and she said, oh, there are flowers on the other side. Right? But so my my early um, connection of comedy and death was that my um, grandmother on my father's side was a very religious woman, um, Florence Johnson. And um, when she died, 
they were going through her closet to decide what to dress her in for the funeral. And she had all these very sober clothes, dark colors. And then in the very back of her closet, there was this outrageous dress, like really colorful flowers, all this sort of amazing pattern. And they're like, let's do it. Let's bury her in this dress. So they put her in the dress. It was an open casket funeral. And our family happened to be seated in a glassed off area so that we could sort of mourn in private. And as the end of the funeral started and people started coming down the aisle, my mother and father started laughing hysterically, like couldn't, like totally laughing hysterically. And I was like, you know, I would have been crying and I was like, what's happening? And then my mom was like, look, look. And coming down the aisle was an old woman dressed ex in the, exactly the same dress as my grandmother. <laughs> And when she got to the casket, she looked in the casket and just was like, Phew, gone out of there. And we never saw her again. <laughs> but that's my story, by the way. It's also a story of synchronicity, which happens. And synchronicity is a message, as according to a lot of people, from the divine spirit. I love synchronicity stories. That mm -hmm. is for sure. And a lot of them happened, um, you know, in the making of this film, I have to say. Um, but but I wanna go back to the thing that you're like, what that you started talking about is sort of like the young self dying, right? The young self dies, we have memories of the young self, correct? And the thing that, that I think is so challenging for children when their parents start to change is that somehow, we as children hold a fixed image of our parents. They are there. And so we don't, we don't think that they have been changing. We don't think that what we have of them is memory. We have their presence. And it is so sort of locked in the past and the present in a parent that we don't expect them to change. And, you know, so I think in some ways, for me, when I say the mantra at the end of the film, Dick Johnson is dead, I am acknowledging to myself that the Dick Johnsons that I knew, the many Dick Johnsons that I knew, some of them are gone. And, and you would say, Deepak, in a certain way, that is what we have to do with every human in every moment, is sort of let go of the person that we knew and encounter the person who is here with us now. So Kirsten, every night, what I do is before I go to sleep, I do a process called recapitulation, which means I recapitulate every experience I've had during the day. You know, waking up, brushing my teeth, going to the bathroom. It takes only five minutes to observe that. And then I remind myself that that is over, it's day. Okay, and, but I'm still here. So who is the me that is still here when the past is gone. And this raises some very big questions in neuroscience today. So you mentioned, you know, your mother once said, I wonder what's on the other side. Now, you know, there are a certain number of people at the last moments of death, they have what is called a lucid moment. Normally our brain waves uh, are cycle at about uh, 12 to 14 cycles. Right now, as we're speaking, our brain waves are cycling around 12 to 14. If you go into meditation, they cycle between 8 and 12. If you go into deep sleep or dreams, you, they cycle between 4 and 6 and, and deep sleep under 4. In this moment, which is called lucid moment, near death lucidity is called, brain waves fire at gamma frequency which is 40 cycles. And people have actual vision of meeting dead relatives and meeting loved ones. They actually have that experience. It's documented now. So who are they having the experience and what is the image of that person that they're having? It's the image that is their favorite image, you know, of their, of their parent or their loved one because no image is fixed. And who remembers? I remember you remember what is that i am that remembers and where is memory so this is called the hard problem in neuroscience of consciousness because nobody can find memories in the brain there's no memory in the brain in fact 
if I learned to ice skate or swim when I was six years old, the brain that learned how to swim is not the brain that swims today. You know, I, the other day I was at Rockefeller Center last year and I was at the skating rink and, you know, I picked up skates and I started to skate and I hadn't skated in 40 years. So now which brain learned the skating and which brain is now doing the skating? They're two different brains altogether. So where is memory? And more and more consciousness experts think memory is not in the brain. Memory is in what you and I in spiritual tradition would call the soul. But of course, cognitive scientists don't like to use words soul and God and divine. They say in core consciousness. So memories are in that place of ourselves, which we say, I am, before I say, I am Deepak Chopra. Okay, so before I'm Deepak Chopra, and before you say, I'm Kirsten, we both have a common identity, which is called I am. Then Kirsten is a bunch of memories, and Deepak is a bunch of memories, and those exist in core consciousness, which spiritual traditions call the soul, which has no place, location, and space time. It is timeless. Therefore, it is not subject to birth and death. I hope that makes sense. Totally makes sense. And, you know, for me, the experience that I had with my mother's Alzheimer's, it, it was such a powerful transformation of her that for many years, it affected my own memory. Um, I think, you know, I just was trying to like, understand her world and be in her world. And so I like existed very much in the present with her. And, but I started having a really hard time remembering things myself. And at the time I was traveling a lot, I was working on a lot of films. So I was going from, you know, Yemen to Liberia to Afghanistan and, and from one day to the next. And so it was already like a lot to ask of a brain to sort of hold all of those contradictions and juxtapositions in place. But as my mother's memory got worse, I, I really started to notice like, wow, I, where was I last week? I totally can't remember. And as the Alzheimer's went on, I started to like really try to remember who my mother was before the dementia. And it was incredibly difficult. And then at the end of her life, um, you know, there was just a moment when I saw her and I realized like, oh, this is it. She's not gonna be here much longer. And for the first time I pulled out the camera and I filmed her, which she really didn't wanna be filmed. And she definitely didn't wanna be filmed. You know, her lucid self would not have been wanted, wanted to be been filmed in her demented state, but I did it because I needed it. And I said to myself, I'll never use this footage. Well, of course, you know, 10 years later, I was like, oof, maybe could I look at that footage? And the editor who worked on this film and who worked on camera person, Nels Bangerder, I hadn't looked at the footage, but he put the footage in this order. He put a shot of me handling my mother's ashes first. And then he put the shot of my mother, um, you know, that I had filmed in this moment when I was so afraid to film her. And he showed me the cut. And in that moment, just for a second, I was like, oh, my mother's alive. And in the movie, she had gone from being the box of ashes. She'd done the reverse journey of your grandfather, right? She went from the box of ashes to suddenly she was alive and I could see her. And I was like, oh, cinema can do this. Cinema can bring people back to life. Um, and so in many ways, what I had learned from the experience with my mother was that my memory was not reliable. Like, it's really interesting that you're saying the process that you do every day of like recapitulation of what the day was. I'm curious, like, do, you must do it every day, right? Like you can't, you, you can't think further back or do you ever try to think way further back? Do you try to recapitulate like last year at this time or you just stick with the day? I do that too. I go back all the way to my earliest memories as a child. Occasionally I do a whole life review as well. Nice. I recognize that then I'm the witnessing awareness in which that life review is happening and that which is reviewing is not in time. That's the most important thing that you get out of this exercise that I that is watching my life go by, 
I am the same being. I'm not the same person, but I'm the same being. We call ourselves human beings. We don't call ourselves human doings or human thinkings or human memories or human desires. We call ourselves human beings. Everything else is a fluctuation in that being. And the fluctuation is in time, but the being is not in time. So it's, this is a very useful exercise to do because what you realize is that which remembers is not in time. And actually you don't remember, you reconstruct. Mm -hmm. Don't remember because all you have is this moment. And what you remember is what is significant. If I asked you, what were you doing last Tuesday at three in the afternoon? You probably don't remember because it wasn't significant. But you know, you remember 9-11. You remember, I remember the day Kennedy was shot. And remember the day Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Why? Because that was emotional. And those memories that are linked to emotions, good, bad, pleasurable, suffering, those hang on. And those in Eastern wisdom traditions are called karma. Karma is just memory that recycles as desire and reconstruction of memory, which kind of binds us in a recycling program of, uh, of pleasure and pain. But mm -hmm. the one who's having the memory is beyond that. Mm -hmm. all, all time. So you hang on to that, which is beyond time. And then you realize that birth, death are human constructs, just like the body, mind, and universe are human constructs. For what? For perceptual and cognitive fluctuations in consciousness, which is the only reality. Deepak, I love, I love the, I love the memories that are the desires. Yes. I, I gotta ask you, like, do you have a living will, Deepak? Yes. Nice. I love it. Yes. <laughs> so, so. When I, so like when I realized how my memory could fail me in terms of my desire, which was to hold on to my mother pre-dementia, what I found in cinema was that it, that the, the moving image, which is sort of like, you know, functions the same way uh, consciousness functions. It takes like sensory material, sound, image, and it puts it together and then you feel, right? And so I realized like, wow, my memory of my father is going to be obliterated by the presence of his dementia. But if I can make a movie, in some ways I can make a hallucination of him. And in some ways I can hold him or put him back together as the dementia is pulling him apart. And so it became, you know, this thing for me, it became this idea of the ci cinema will replace my, my effort at remembering. But in fact, what you're saying in some ways is like cinema is the expression of my desire. Cinema, and is, that makes a lot of sense. cinema is the expression of your desire. And the person you see right now as having dementia or Alzheimer's is a snapshot of that person. And it's one snapshot of that person. But if you put all the snapshots together, you'll see it's a movie. And who's projecting the movie? You are projecting. That's the movie. right. That's so right. And that was, it was right now is a movie. Yeah. And, and I can tell you that um, while we were making the film, I was sort of gripped by this sensation of grief and failure that I had started too late. Um, that uh, my father was already further gone than who I wish to remember. So that the sort of evidence I had was already evidence that, um, you know, did not contain the thing I was worried about losing. But in fact, with the accumulation little by little of all of these fragments of my father, uh, suddenly one day we were watching the rough, rough cut and I just started weeping because I was like, we have his essence. That's it. We have it. <laughs> the soul is the essence. That's what awareness is. So I am Deepak Chopra. I am Kirsten. Those are memories and desires in a 
core consciousness, which is universal. I am is a universal feeling. I am Deepak is a unique feeling and they're both connected. They're both equally true. Mm, 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 mm. I just um, read a remarkable um, book by um, someone named Damon Galgut. And he does this incredible thing with pronouns where sometimes he's talking in the third person and sometimes he's talking in the first person. And he's talking about memories, uh, but then sometimes he enters the memory as the I. And um, I think for me in some ways, like this is this, this thinking about the, the time and space, right? Like where am I in time and space? And what you're saying about sort of memory is that we, we can revisit the memory of ourselves and the desire of ourselves. So here's my, my sort of next wonder. And in some ways, I think uh, this has to do with filmmaking because it's about editing. The things that we edit out about ourselves. Um, I love the moment where you're talking about the complexity of things and how things are in contradiction and, and um, that, you know, it's not all good. So if we're the ones in charge of uh, going back and sort of editing, recapitulating ourselves, do you, is that, is that that wish fulfillment of our self? Are we constantly all rewriting a self that's like our best self? our most, the self we desire most. In fact, that self has no faults or contradictions, but like, and this is one of the things I'm really always fascinated is like our own blind spots. Like I'm always interested in how, how can I see my own blind spots? Okay, so, I'm, so I'm curious about like, I'm curious about um, in your formulation, how do we avoid uh, idealizing our own selves? How do we remain slightly uh, like, self-critical. Okay, so consciousness has many aspects. The most fundamental level of consciousness is called pure consciousness, which is prior to all experience. That consciousness is infinite, infinite possibilities, synchronicity, unpredictable, the source of attention, intention, memory, desire. That's pure consciousness. But then there's the fragmented self, which very frequently we call the ego identity which is separate and yet connected to the, the pure self because the pure self is aware of the ego. Who or what is aware of the ego is the pure self. The ego on the other hand is always looking for validation, who's superior, who's inferior. Oh yeah. <laughs> who am I inferior to? Basically your ego identity is your selfie. We sacrifice ourselves for our selfies. Mm -hmm. Then we identify with the selfie. We say, that's who I am. And then the rest of our life we are screwed because the right. selfie is in need of validation. Mm -hmm. So here's the key. We are constantly editing experience to make ourselves feel good. But we also beat ourselves. You know, we feel guilt, we feel shame, we feel anger, we feel resentment, we feel hostility, we feel victimized. All of that is also part of the selfie, of the self uh, that we call me. Now, the key here is that's not going to disappear, okay? Because without that, you wouldn't have a personality. So that's your personality. If it is in the background and your self is in the foreground, then you're free to upgrade your selfie. Otherwise, your selfie can become a nightmare, which is what happens. And the collective nightmare then appears in the world as a collective shadow, war, terrorism, eco-destruction, um, racism, hatred, bigotry, prejudice, um, you know, all the things that are leading humans to extinction are actually the collective projection of the shadow self which we are denying in ourselves. Mm. That all resonates. I, 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 I think we're about ready to take some questions. I have a question, you know, for me in this process, I feel like um, I was really engaged with anticipatory grief. I know that I was deeply engaged with that with my mother. And in this case, I was trying to transform it into humor, into irreverence, into surrealism. But I, you know, I feel in this period of the pandemic that we are collectively engaged 
in the questions of anticipatory grief. We don't, we don't know what we've lost yet fully. Some people actually have lost people they love. I've collectively, we've lost our way of living. We are reorienting towards that. I'm just curious about your relationship to anticipatory grief, Deepak, because uh, like given your practice, um, does anticipatory grief resonate for you? Grief resonates. As a physician, I've witnessed a lot of grief, okay? And I've seen people in different stages of grief. So some people are feeling victimized when they're experiencing grief. Grief occurs when you lose something, lose a way of life, as we did with the pandemic also. So we are experiencing grief. So grief, some people feel victimized. Some get angry. Some are frustrated. Some get helpless. Some uh, actually get so scared and panic that they die from the grief. Only some find acceptance. And once they find acceptance, then they find meaning. So for, for me right now is why did we take existence for granted? Why do we take existence for granted? To me, that I exist is a perpetual surprise. And I think if you're not surprised that you exist, then your humanity is incomplete. And but the fact that existence is a perpetual surprise fills me with immense gratitude for this moment. And mm. so when I have this gratitude, I don't feel grief. Mm, mm, mm. uh, there's someone named Dan who asked, why do we take experience for granted? It's the hypnosis of social conditioning. We're sleepwalking. We are biological robots who recycle everybody else's thoughts. Mm. Hmm. I, you know, it's like you know, it's we don't have a single original thought, humanity, unless you're an Einstein or a Beethoven or a Mozart or a Vivaldi or a great artist or a filmmaker like oh, yourself. Definitely, right here. Yeah. Filmmaker yeah. <laughs> like yourself. Most of our thoughts are recycled social media. That's all they are. Hmm. I don't know, Deepak. I, I, you know, in in our editing the film, we we always said to ourselves, the audience knows a lot more than we do. If they people, people in the audience have lived through death. People, there are people in the audience who have lost a child. There are people in the audience who have lived through war. There are people who have survived genocides. All of these people know more th about death. Yes, but person, they process yes. the experience in the same way uh, for thousands of years. They don't question what is the meaning. And you know, when you actually question the meaning, reflect on it, on just one question, who am I, what am I, what is it that wants to know the mystery of death, you have a deeper insight. And that's what your film does, by the way. Your mm. film does that very effectively because it's a very original way of looking at death. Mm. Mm. I, I, my, my sense is that what I hope to do is like give us a way to face the fear together, me and my dad. And the thing that's amazing about my dad is that, that he, he, he could do that. He could play with the fear and the real loss. Like, like this, it's like, he could face that. And, and, and much of the time he was like incredibly empathetic to me and would say like, it must really be hard to watch me losing my mind. Yeah. And he would say, you know, I remember one day we were lost in, uh, on, a, on a street corner and I was like, dad, I'm not sure where we are. Do you have any idea where we are? And he was like, he's like, I really have no idea where I am. And he said, you know, when you lose your sense of space and time, it's really hard to hold on to your sense of self. And so he had this like incredible capacity and he still has it, um, even though he is now in a dementia care facility and he doesn't totally understand that the film's out in the world, but he will say to me, I just want you to be clear that you know I love you. That's so beautiful. That's, and that's like, that is like, that is his mission in like, he's, he's detached from time and space, but he just wants to make sure that I know that he sees me and he cares about me. That's his presence speaking to you. And therefore also love 
the, the experience that we call love is not a mere sentiment or emotion. It's the ultimate truth at the heart of creation. Love is not in space time. I'm gonna, I am so with that Deepak, that is so true. Love is not in space time. I don't know where it is, but I sure can feel it when I feel it. <laughs> and your uh, audience, Nancy Wilson is saying love is eternal. Yeah. And I do think maybe that, you know, like when I say my mother is here, you know, it's like, I've got this board behind me that I put up that's like, uh, I'm start, it's a board that I can put magnets on and, and the kids have been coming in and drawing and painting and we've been putting stuff up on the board and my mother's favorite color was orange and my favorite color is orange. And then my daughter just like drew this amazing orange blob for me. And it's like, it's like, that's the like love flowing through. Like she knows that that's my color, that I love that color. And then we just like keep it moving on. And Andy's got his orange wall right there. Um, and, and, and I think that's the thing. It's like, we, we help each other remember how to love when, when things are um, deeply challenging. And I think that is the moment that we're in with this pandemic is how do we, how do we like, do all of us deal with our zoom fatigue with the fact we can't touch each other with you know like this sense of our disconnectedness how do we find ways to connect and that's what you know i'm so moved by the way that you've come to this conversation and the way that you came to me with this sort of openness like let's talk about this movie um and and you with you have brought all of these people who wish to listen to you because you have created the work that you've created. So I am filled with eternal love and gratitude <laughs> to you. Um, and I think, you know, Andy, we're probably close to being able to wrap it up, but do is anyone see any questions in the chat that we must desperately address before we close this on the in the spirit of eternal love? I sure. want to say one thing, and that okay. is never alone dot love is that's what it's all about that mm -hmm. we all hang in together with attention appreciation affection and acceptance and that's a good start to for the next pandemic the next pandemic is love in action mm, i love it deepak and and, and you know it, uh, you know my my dad my dad did work as a psychiatrist and in making this film i learned that he did have a couple of patients who did succeed in committing suicide, which I didn't know before. Um, and my father um, always expressed doubts about his capacity as a psychiatrist to heal mental illness and expressed doubts about medication. But what he would say, if anything can heal, it is the healthy relationship that can heal. It's like the process of being and staying in the process. And that's what a psychiatrist can potentially do for another human who is suicidal is to affirm there is an ongoing relationship which values your presence here on this earth. Mm -hmm. um, which is, I think, you know, what you're, where you're coming from with this effort to prevent suicide. It's like, let us affirm. Yes, and we exist only in relationship. Without relationship, there is no identity. Yeah. Oh, I have one more for you, Deepak. So I think images themselves are relationships. Absolutely. You're with me? Yeah, and sensations, perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts are entangled. So as yes. soon as you think of your father, there's an image and there's a feeling at the same time. They totally entangled, total entanglement. I feel entangled with you right now, Deepak. I think that, uh, Brad, did you wanna finish off? Before, the... before I give it to Brad, I do wanna give an opportunity to hear from all of you. I'm launching this poll, which appears on the screen. Uh, and if you guys could fill this out, I would really appreciate this. Um, the first question, after reflecting on this discussion about the human life cycle, do you believe that death is real? And number two, after this, this experience, do you feel comfortable having conversations with loved ones about caregiving or planning? The third one, did you attend any previous conversation ses sessions led by 
Kirsten as part of this Reimagine Festival, and you get extra points if you did. And number four, how did you hear about this program from Kirsten and Deepak? Um, while you're doing that, I'm gonna ask Brad to get ready to say a few words to all of us, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of time so we can gather as much data as possible. And I, I just wanna say that I hope when all of you recapitulate tonight, you'll be thinking fondly of this experience. So thank you, thank you both. I think I'm with you Deepak, I don't think death is real. I think I'm gonna vote no. It's the, 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 no, it's not real. I, th I think you might have you might have converted me tonight, but definitely, definitely, love is eternal, and it's not connected to the time space continuum. Thank you. Great, Brad. Do you want to say a few words now? Sure. I I, I would just like to come on here right now and first of all say that I am in this moment feeling the gratitude and the love. Uh, for for really all of you who are here bearing witness and being together in this moment in this space but especially for deepak and for kirsten uh for such a high level conversation i mean if i'm sure all of your brains expanded out there i'm gonna think differently about movies throughout yeah. the rest of my life selfies I have evolved, uh, but you also gave us things to believe in that we want to believe in. I mean, that was, you know, all the things you said are things we want to to be true. And thank you for, for I, I don't even know what the term would be, justifying them for us, but but I, I, they resonate on a very deep level. And I think that's the important thing. And also, I just want to thank Andy um, for for what a great intro and a beautiful session you put together it was so outstanding i just love being here and i, I want to uh take just a minute to zubin have zubin my colleague unmute himself if you don't mind zubin um uh, my colleague zubin so so deepak this this festival that we're doing now is called creating space we call it creating space because we listen to our audience and we asked people, what do you need right now? And people said they wanted more space. We may have space in this pandemic in some ways, but yet we don't have space for the intention. And part of it is also to have models for what, what healthy space can look like that we could create together. And part of what we've learned, especially as an organization that's thinking about um, how we support different communities, uh, communities of color, for example, in this country, and when we think about this conversation about death, you know, maybe there's been a white dominated American culture that has shaped our attitudes in this country. And, and I know from my colleague Zubin, who's one of my best friends, you've actually meant a lot to him in your life and in his life to have someone um, of Indian descent to look up to. Uh, and, and I would just want to invite Zubin, who I know who maybe didn't get to share this Zubin, if you have anything just to share, I, I feel like it'd be special for you just in this moment to maybe share oh. your appreciation for, for, for Deepak yourself. Oh, thank you. I didn't know I was going to be called on, but yeah, I was reflecting on this with Brad. You know, I, I grew up Hindu and I never really felt a connection to spirituality because there was this connection to religion always. And I, you know, had read about spirituality and path to enlightenment, but it hadn't always been white teachers. Um, oftentimes talking about mantras and things in Sanskrit and things from Indian culture. So Deepak, it really, it's been really just, I mean, even it's been, you kickstarted my, my real path of spirituality with your book, the seven spiritual laws of success, that thing kicked it off for me. And I, oh, you have it. Oh, perfect. Um, so I just wanted to express my gratitude and it's just, Amazing. it's just so nice to have you here. And yeah, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Immense gratitude. So thank you, Zubin. Thank you. And, and I just, you know, want to be in the moment with all of you and, and say that, that this, you know, there's been a thousand uh, or so uh, spaces that we've created over the course of this pandemic to be together online. And uh, this is really the close of our festival today. And then tomorrow we're going to be with Neil Gaiman. We're going to be with a rabbi, Sidney Mintz, and an incredible musician. And I invite all of you to join that because it's a candlelight vigil where we're going to be together and honor the people that we love, that we've lost and really honor um, what we have. And there's so much to be grateful for. And so um, with that, just to say thank you again to everybody for being here. Also, I would love it if in the chat, because I, I would like to share some of the great words of, of love and compassion everyone has for Kirsten. 
and for 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 Deepak, uh, if you would please just share your gratitude and what you got out of the session so we can share it forward. Check out Kirsten's film, uh, read Deepak's books, um, support his organization, follow these people, uh, and follow follow your own sense of love. And with that, I bid you adieu, and we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern time for our final candlelight vigil. Thank you again, Kirsten, for being here. Oh, my a honor. Beautiful show. Okay. Last word, Kirsten. I'd like to end with a quote from my favorite Indian poet, Tagore. He said, because I love life, I will love death and celebrate as much as I celebrate life. Mm -hmm.